Okay, so today we will continue with the rest of the mediastinum. We will cover the middle and posterior mediastinum. We discussed in the last lecture how we divide the mediastinum. So today we will talk about the middle and the posterior mediastinum. If we start with this case and I ask the question, what mediastinal line is deviated by the mass? Well, here on the left side, we have the left paraspinal line. Here is the descending thoracic aorta. And then here we have this line that is deviated over. And so this is the azagoesophageal line. So we have a subcarinal lesion here that produces deviation of the azagoesophageal line. So when we see that in terms of our radiologic scheme, we think of middle mediastinal masses. So here's the chest radiograph on this patient. We can see deviation of the azagoesophageal line. On the lateral view, vaguely, we can see some subcarinal opacity there. And here's the CT. Now, if I ask you, what do you think this is? The first thing that might come to mind is a bronchogenic cyst for a subcarinal well-defined mass. But you must look more carefully and notice that these images are without contrast. These images are with contrast and the mass appears to be enhancing. So if there's an enhancing lesion here, between pre and post contrast scans. This cannot be a bronchogenic cyst. This has to be a solid mass. And in this particular case, this was subcarinal lymphadenopathy in a patient who had tuberculosis. So when we dealing with lesions, even in the typical location for bronchogenic cyst, to differentiate bronchogenic cysts from a solid mass. Sometimes it is important to do non-contrast and post-contrast imaging to see if there is enhancement within the lesion. Here's another subcarinal lesion, seems to be well circumscribed here on the chest radiograph. And then here it is, in the subcarinal region on the lateral view. And on CT, we see this uh, subcarinal lesion it is higher in attenuation than simple fluid. When we look though on non-contrast and post-contrast imaging, we notice that it is higher in attenuation on non-contrast imaging, but post-contrast, there really is no enhancement within this lesion. This is a bronchogenic cyst. So bronchogenic cysts can be high in attenuation on non-contrast CT. That's why they can easily be mistaken for solid masses. And it's important to do post-contrast imaging to look for enhancement within the lesion. So this is part of the spectrum of foregut duplication cysts, bronchogenic cysts, esophageal duplication cysts, neuroenteric cysts are all in that spectrum. And these really can occur in all mediastinal compartments, but these are most common in the middle mediastinum, in, especially in the subcarinal region. Now they can enlarge due to hemorrhage or infection. So typical smooth, well-defined subcarinal lesion there on the chest radiograph and on CT, even though these can be high in attenuation, there is no enhancement. They can also be a fluid attenuation, but the important thing is there is no enhancement within these lesions when we do pre and post contrast CT. Other appearances that we can see, we might have some calcification in the cyst wall. You might have some milk of calcium that layers out here. This is the esophagus with some contrast in it next to the lesion. On MR, can be higher in signal on T1 weighted imaging because of proteinaceous contents, but it's very bright or very high in signal intensity on T2 weighted images. Pre and post contrast MR, again, there is no enhancement within this lesion. Now, what about this case? If we show you this paraspinal mass here in this case, and I ask you, is this a solid mass or a cyst? Well, it does appear like the lesion is enhancing here on your immediate post-contrast CT. However, <coughs> when we look on the delayed image, we notice that it does not appear to be enhancing. And this is why it's important when we are evaluating these lesions for enhancement on the initial post-contrast CT, when the vessels are very densely opacified with contrast, you can get this uh, artifactual, uh, artifactually abnormal measurements in terms of density within the lesion. So we have to be careful about that. So I would advise that whenever we're evaluating a mediastinal lesion for enhancement, 
In addition to doing an immediate post-contrast CT, it's also important to do delayed imaging because another thing we need to factor for is sometimes even the enhancement itself might be delayed. So when we're trying to differentiate solid from cystic lesions, in addition to the immediate post-contrast CT, <coughs> it's also important to do delayed imaging about a minute or two after you have given the intravenous contrast. And on this particular lesion, we can see it's very bright on T2-weighted imaging, very bright on T2-weighted imaging, and there is no enhancement with gadolinium. This indeed is a cyst, and we will actually come back to this lesion a little bit later on in this lecture. Okay, so here's our next case. Again, we have this rounded lesion here behind the heart on the lateral view. We can see that it is in the middle mediastinum. And on CT, we can see that it is fluid attenuation, but this lesion is somewhat lower than the typical location of a bronchogenic cyst, and this is also in contact with the esophagus. This is an esophageal duplication cyst. So an esophageal duplication cyst is a foregut uh, duplication cyst lined by gastrointestinal mucosa. So most of these are located in the lower mediastinum adjacent to the esophagus, sometimes within the esophageal wall. Here's another nice example. There's the esophagus fluid attenuation lesion. Seems to be arising from the esophageal wall and the appearance very similar to bronchogenic cyst, except this is in contact with the esophagus. Here's a, another case where we have this round lesion here, large round lesion uh, in the mediastinum and on CT fluid attenuation in contact with the esophageal wall. This again was an esophageal duplication cyst. Now, what about this case here? Well, here we have some deviation of the trachea, especially on the lateral view. We also notice it looks like there's a soft tissue mass here impinging on the posterior wall or invading the trachea. Well, what lives behind the trachea? That is the esophagus. So here we need to be concerned about esophageal neoplasm, especially esophageal cancer. This is an easy diagnosis. On CT, we have circumferential narrowing of the esophagus there on CT, so that is an esophageal cancer. So esophageal lesions can also give you middle mediastinal masses. These usually present with dysphagia before they're large enough to be seen. On the chest radiograph, you might also get an air fluid level from esophageal obstruction, and you can get thickening, of course, of the tracheoesophageal stripe or the retrotracheal stripe because the esophagus is anatomically just posterior to the trachea. So we'll get narrowing of the esophagus in the circumferential mass. Uh, you might have loss of parasophageal fat planes. You might also have lymphadenopathy. So this is usually not a difficult diagnosis on CT. Now, what about this lesion? Here we have a mass also appears to be related to the esophagus here. There's some calcification within the lesion. But as opposed to circumferential thickening of the esophageal wall, as we've seen with esophageal cancer, the bulk of this lesion seems to be outside of the esophagus. Here on this reconstruction, we can see the mass here. Here is the esophagus. Although it encroaches a little bit on the lumen, most of this mass is outside of the esophagus. So what would we consider here? This is an esophageal gist tumor. It used to be called lyomyomas or lyomyosarcomas. They can grow extra luminally to large size without causing dysphagia. So this is a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. These arise within the esophageal wall. Most are located in the distal third of the esophagus. And you might see a smooth, well-defined mass inseparable from the esophagus and as opposed to esophageal cancer. These lesions usually do not cause esophageal obstruction and they may contain calcium. Here's a much larger example. So there's this large lesion and we can see it's right next to the esophagus. Some encroachment on the lumen, but really not causing significant obstruction. This was also a gist tumor of the esophagus. Now, what about this case? <clears throat> we have this large mass here extending down, seems to extend below the diaphragm. Here we can see the right heart border. This mass way up here extends all the way down. On the lateral view, there is some mass effect on the trachea. Again, the esophagus is behind the trachea, 
But a very interesting finding here is this air fluid level here and on the frontal view. So this represents a dilated esophagus full of debris with an air fluid level. This is an example of achalasia. So with achalasia, we will have a dilated esophagus. It's dilated down to the gastroesophageal junction, as we can see on these CT images. And of course, in a barium study, the typical beak sign of achalasia is a sagittal reformatted CT showing you the dilated esophagus extending all the way down to the gastroesophageal junction. So we want to be able to recognize achalasia on the uh, plain film because it might have uh, quite a characteristic appearance. And we know the cause, of course, of achalasia, inability of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax for the passage of food. So on the chest radiograph, we might see a large mass like this extending down when the esophagus is distended, it often flops to the right. So you will see the right heart border often medial to this large opacity as it extends down below the diaphragm to the gastroesophageal junction. But the lateral view is often the key view here. It shows you the anterior deviation of the trachea. You can see the air fluid level. This mass extends all the way down along the course of the esophagus. So we don't want to miss the appearance of achalasia on chest radiograph. Other things that can give you middle mediastinal masses, of course, there's lymphadenopathy, can be from metastatic disease. These are tumors that can metastasize to the mediastinum renal cell cancer as a propensity to metastasize to mediastinal and hyalur nodes. But as we know, any, any tumor, any neoplasm might be able to do that. Here's an example of somebody with a renal mass with metastatic disease to the bones here, vertebra and the sternum. Notice the right paratracheal lymphadenopathy on the chest radiograph. We can also see the right paratracheal lymphadenopathy. So renal cancer has a propensity to metastasize to nodes within the thorax. And then of course there are other diseases like sarcoid which can also give you mediastinal lymphadenopathy. And some of these patients will also have parenchymal changes from sarcoid. Of course, bilateral symmetric hyalur lymphadenopathy is a hallmark of sarcoid, and we should always consider sarcoid if we happen to see that. So bilateral symmetric hyalur lymphadenopathy, in this case also some right paratracheal lymphadenopathy. We see that on the CT, bilateral hyalur nodes and right paratracheal nodes. So sarcoid, another disease that can give us lymphadenopathy within the mediastinum and subcranial lymphadenopathy can also be typical with sarcoidosis. TB and fungal infection, we've also covered this earlier in the lecture series. This can also give you lymphadenopathy, especially low attenuation lymphadenopathy with peripheral enhancement. And here's an example of tuberculosis, giving us this extensive low attenuation lymphadenopathy here. Uh, and you can see on the chest radiograph, right paratracheal lymphadenopathy and also some hyalur lymphadenopathy, AP window lymphadenopathy also in this case. So infections like TB and atypical mycobacterial infection might also give you mediastinal lymphadenopathy. We have discussed pneumoconiosis like silicosis. This can give you eggshell calcifications of lymph nodes. So this might be a, also a characteristic feature of silicosis. There is a differential for eggshell calcification of lymph nodes most closely associated with silicosis, but it might also seen might also be seen with TB treated lymphoma and sarcoid. Drugs can also give you mediastinal lymphadenopathy as a drug reaction. Here's his right paratracheal nodes in this case. So we can see that with these anti-seizure medications like phenytoin and trimethodione, although methotrexate might also give you mediastinal lymphadenopathy as a drug reaction. Okay, so here's our next case. It shows mediastinal widening here. And when we look on CT, we notice that there's a process here in the mediastinum that is encasing the blood vessels. You can see narrowing of the superior vena cava, marked narrowing here of the left inferior pulmonary vein. So what does this process turn out to be? Well, certainly in your differential, you can have neoplasms like metastatic disease or lymphoma. Lymphoma would be a a nice thought for this, but this was fibrosing mediastinitis. So fibrosing mediastinitis can also give you enlargement of mediastinal lymph nodes. 
from the excessive production of fibrous tissue in the mediastinum. So it can occur from granulomatous disease affecting the mediastinum, but it can also be idiopathic. So in terms of the causes, can most common cause from granulomatous disease or infection is histoplasmosis, although we might see it with TB and sarcoid. We can see it also with drugs like methasergide. It can also be associated with these connective tissue diseases. And it might also be associated with sometimes radiation therapy, but also IgG4 disease. Those patients uh, can also be predisposed to retroperitoneal fibrosis, sclerosing cholangitis, autoimmune pancreatitis, and Riedel's sclerosing thyroiditis. So most common causes histoplasmosis, tuberculosis, and here the fibrosis can obstruct structures in the mediastinum and the superior vena cave is the most common. These other structures, especially the pulmonary vein, can also be obstructed. Or And interstitial edema, especially asymmetric interstitial edema, can occur from fibrosing mediastinitis. Hemoptysis might also be an additional complication. The appearance on chest radiograph is nonspecific. You'll get this nonspecific widening there of the mediastinum. And if it's from granulomatous disease like histoplasmosis or sarcoid, you can see calcification of these lymph nodes. There's calcification here of these nodes. There's also narrowing here of the right pulmonary artery there in the mediastinum as it is encased by this fibrotic process in the mediastinum. Here's the angiogram on that particular patient showing you the narrowing of the pulmonary vessels as a result of the fibrosis in the mediastinum. In our next example, we have some calcified lymph nodes here. Notice the superior vena cava is obstructed in this case. The azagous vein has dense undiluted contrast in it. And this patient also has some consolidation here in pleural effusion. This is pulmonary edema, and this is pulmonary edema from obstruction of the pulmonary vein. So fibrosing mediastinitis can also give you obstruction of pulmonary veins and can result in asymmetric pulmonary edema. Now, non-granulomatous fibrosing mediastinitis, here we have a more diffuse form of fibrosis without calcification. So this is usually autoimmune and you might see, again, compression or encasement of these structures in the mediastinum. And this can be associated with these diseases, especially IgG4 disease. So that's non-granulomatous fibrosing mediastinitis. Now, what about this case? Here on the non-contrast CT, we see these nodular opacities representing lymph nodes and large lymph nodes post-contrast, marked enhancement of lymph nodes. So what can give you marked enhancement of lymph nodes? Certainly you can have vascular metastases like renal, thyroid, melanoma, Kaposi's, islet cell tumors, choriocarcinoma. These, these are all examples of vascular types of metastatic lesions that might occur. But this was a case of Castleman. So Castleman's also called angiofollicular mediastinal lymph node hyperplasia. Here the vessels also proliferate within the lymph nodes and that can give you this marked enhancement of lymph nodes. Two types, highland vascular type, usually localized in the plasma cell variety, often multicentric. So the highland vascular type tends to be localized and this can give you focal areas of lymphadenopathy in the mediastinum, especially in young patients. Many of these patients might be asymptomatic. Here you can see some marked enhancement of these mediastinal nodes in this particular variety of Castleman's disease. The plasma cell form affects older patients, commonly multicentric, potentially malignant, can be associated with Kaposi's, AIDS, and these other syndromes. So this can also give you enhancing nodes, splenomegaly, and retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy. This is a patient uh, with AIDS, has these enhancing lymph nodes here in the mediastinum and also here within the axilla, as you can see on the CT scan and here also. So multiple locations for these marked enhancing lymph nodes. Uh, this is the plasma cell type of Castleman's disease in a patient with AIDS. All right, so that is our discussion of uh, middle mediastinal masses. Those, so these, of course, are entities with which you need to be familiar. And of course, don't forget about aneurysm and lung cancer for any of the 
mediastinal compartments. So let's move on. So here in our next case, we can see a mass here, but notice the superior border of the mass is clearly delineated. That is the cervical thoracic sign. So this indicates that this is interfacing with air, so it must be posteriorly located. So we think here of posterior mediastinal masses and the most common in that category would be neurogenic tumor. So here on T1, T2 weighted imaging, we can see markedly increased signal here on T2 weighted imaging, and there is some peripheral enhancement there with gadolinium. This was a neurofibroma. So here's our next case. This patient has this kind of lobular mediastinal mass. Again, notice the cervical thoracic sign telling you that there is a component of this that is posteriorly located. And here on the CT, we notice though multiple lesions throughout the mediastinum, also paraspinal lesions here in the posterior mediastinum, widening of neural foramina, lesions also in the axilla. Some of these lesions are low in attenuation. This is a patient with neurofibromatosis and multiple neurofibromas. So in the posterior mediastinum, nerve sheath tumors uh, should be a uh, something that should be high on your differential diagnosis. They can be schwannomas, neurofibromas, and in some cases, neurogenic sarcomas when you get uh, malignant degeneration of these tumors. So for nerve sheath tumors, these tend to be smooth, round masses in the paravertebral region. They can grow slowly, cause scalloping of adjacent vertebra and the ribs. With neurofibromatosis, often more than one tumor, especially in the paraspinal regions with widening of neuroforamina. You can also have plexiform neurofibromas elsewhere, especially in the axilla, and you can also have neurofibromas there within the mediastinum, and sometimes they can be low in attenuation as on this CT scan. Now, what about this case? If I ask you what sign is demonstrated, we notice there is a mass here, but as we follow it below the diaphragm, we can see again the lateral border clearly. So this is kind of the corollary to the cervical thoracic sign. Remember, if we can see the lateral border clearly, it's telling us that the lesion is interfacing with air. This is the thoracal abdominal sign. So this also tells us that this lesion is posterior. So we have a lesion located again in the posterior mediastinum. Here is the CT paraspinal mass widening of the neuroforamina. Again, we think neurogenic lesion. But what is interesting about this tumor, usually neurofibromas around, but this tumor, the long axis of the tumor is parallel to the spine. And in that case, you should consider the ganglion series of tumors. So here on T1, a T2-weighted imaging, very bright. And we can see when we give contrast marked enhancement extending through the neuroforamina in this particular case. So in very young children with an appearance like that, you would think of neuroblastoma, but in, uh, in somewhat older children or young adults, you would think ganglioneuroma, and that was the case for that particular tumor. That was a ganglioneuroma. So in between, you can have ganglioneuroblastomas. So neuroblastomas, very young age, ganglioneuroblastomas, one to 10, and when we get into the older age group, for these ganglion series of tumors, we can think ganglioneuromas. So for the sympathetic ganglion tumors, they appear more as vertically oriented masses. So the long axis of the tumor tends to be parallel to the spine. So here's an example there, this paravertebral mass that was a sympathetic ganglion tumor. So soft tissue mass in the paravertebral location may show an homogeneous uh, enhancement. Now, this patient presents with hypertension and elevated catecholamines. And we see here a mass. And this mass is markedly enhancing, again, in the posterior mediastinum. Well, with this particular history, we're going to be thinking of, uh, of an extra adrenal pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. So these tumors arise from neuroectodermal cells related to the autonomic nervous system. And uh, they're very rare actually in the chest, but they can occur around the aortic arch, aortic body tumors in the sympathetic chain in the posterior mediastinum or in or adjacent to the heart, especially within the atria. One third are functional resulting in symptoms from excess catecholamines and 10% can be malignant. We can also have these 
aortic body tumors. And it's the paravertebral tumors that tend to be hormonally active. 50% of paravertebral paragangliomas produce excess catecholamines. We can also look for these tumors with nuclear medicine imaging using I-131 MIBG to look for these lesions. So they give you this enhancing lesions. These are vascular lesions, so they're, they can be enhancing as in that case. They occur in the paraspinal region as in that case. And with MIBG, you can also see increased activity. Here's one here arising there within the heart near the right atrium. We can see increased activity here within this paraganglioma on this nuclear medicine study. So here is a representation of the locations of where these neurogenic tumors can be located in the mediastinum. We can have these aortal pulmonary paraganglia, sympathetic trunk here. We have these ganglia and can also have tumors along the spinal and intercostal nerves. Here's an aortopulmonary paraganglioma. Okay, so this is a child who has a large posterior mediastinal mass. So here you might think of neuroblastoma. However, if we look carefully on the frontal view, we notice that there are these cleft vertebra. So if you have vertebral anomalies associated with a posterior mediastinal mass here in an infant, you should think of something something else. Notice that it is low in signal on T1, very bright on T2. This is a neuroenteric cyst. So these neuroenteric cysts, these occur in the posterior mediastinum. Uh, they can be connected with the meninges, may communicate with the subarachnoid space. Uh, the clue is vertebral anomalies like hemivertebra, butterfly vertebra, clefts, spina bifida, so if we have an infant with a posterior mediastinal mass with abnormal vertebra, we might consider a neuroenteric cyst. So round or oval shaped posterior mediastinal mass and look for the vertebral anomalies here. So there it is, uh, low in signal on T1, very bright, very high in signal on T2 weighted imaging. Now, what about this case here? We have a fluid attenuation mass. It seems to be extending through the neuroforamina. So what might this be? If we also look carefully here, we notice all of these skin lesions. This is a patient with neurofibromatosis. So this represents a lateral thoracic meningocele. So this is anomalous herniation of the spinal meninges here. Often it's associated with neurofibromatosis and scoliosis and may occur at the apex of the curve in these patients with scoliosis. So it gives you a paravertebral mass as in this example. So uh, it's low attenuation, it's fluid attenuation because it communicates with the CSF. And if you do a myelogram, you will see the contrast filling the lesion. So that is a lateral thoracic meningocele associated with neurofibromatosis. So if I tell you this patient has chest pain radiating to the back, we look at the chest radiograph here. Do we notice anything? Well, there does seem to be something here along the right paravertebral region. We look carefully at the old study four years prior. Here is the right heart border. Nothing there in the paravertebral region. Here's the right heart border on the current study. Seems to be something in the paravertebral region there on the right side and also on the left side. So we have paravertebral mass in this patient with back pain. So what could this be? Well, this is something else in our differential for posterior mediastinal masses. And again, close up showing you the paravertebral mass here on the current study and nothing on the old study. And here is our CT. So now we see that we have the paraspinal collections here with destruction of the vertebral body. This is a paraspinal abscess. And this patient also has a right pleural effusion. So from discitis and osteomyelitis, patients can develop paraspinal abscesses, which can also give you a posterior mediastinal mass. Often it's from tuberculosis that extends to the disc and causes discitis and osteomyelitis. You'll get destruction of the end plates, narrowing of the disc, and collapse of the, and collapse of the vertebra can give you a gibbous deformity. And you can have paravertebral masses if we have paravertebral abscesses here, paraspinal mass. So here you have the typical gibbous deformity as collapse of one vertebral body into another in this patient who had discitis and osteomyelitis from TB. 
And then here on CT, we can see the paraspinal collection, and this is the paraspinal abscess. And with these chronic abscesses, especially from TB, we might also see calcification within the wall of the abscess. Here on MR, you can see these paraspinal masses with destruction of the end plates um, and the ends of the vertebra. Okay, so here's our next case. So we look carefully here. There's kind of a vague mass, I suppose, in the retrocardiac region. And here on the CT, we get a better view. Heart looks big, small pericardial fusion. There is this right paravertebral mass. Interestingly, it seems to have a little bit of fat in it there. Here again, it is. there it is on coronal views. And notice there's more than one lesion here. There's a lesion. This is the largest. Smaller lesions here and here. And then also interesting on the CT, we look at the spleen and notice that there's this very small calcified spleen. So this patient has an autoinfarcted spleen. There are also some bony changes here. This is a patient with sickle cell disease. So in patients with anemia who have posterior mediastinal masses, here we must consider extramedullary hematopoiesis. So it's associated with severe hemolytic anemia, thalassemia, hereditary spherocytosis, sickle cell anemia. So it may arise from herniation of the vertebral or rib marrow through small cortical defects. So usually it gives you paraspinal masses, as we see on this chest radiograph, usually multiple and bilateral. And here again, we have these masses, but notice also changes in the bones. You can get expansion of the bone marrow. So often the bones look abnormal in these patients as a result of the underlying anemia. Okay, so let's move on to our next case. So CT, low attenuation lesion there in the paravertebral region in this 53-year-old woman. We see that it's very low signal on T1, high signal on T2, so it looks fluidy and there's no enhancement here. High signal on T2, no enhancement with gadolinium. So this is some kind of paravertebral cyst. So what does this represent in a 53-year-old woman? What might we consider? This is a fairly recently described entity. This is called a cyst of a tori, or posterior mediastinal paravertebral malarian cyst. So these arise in the paravertebral region. They are lined by ciliated epithelium, histologically identical to fallopian tube, might be remnant of embryonic malarian tissue, hence malarian cyst. They are responsive, they, or they do have estrogen and progesterone receptors, affects women 40 to 60 years of age, and it can be associated with these other issues, obesity, hormone replacement therapy, high estradiol, previous gynecologic diseases, solitary cysts between T3 and T8. Some articles recommend surgery, although truthfully, I have not seen an article describing actually malignant degeneration in any of these lesions. So it's a cystic lesion, very bright on T2-weighted imaging, no enhancement with gadolinium. Cystophatory or posterior mediastinal paravertebral malarian cyst. These are types of mediastinal cysts you might encounter. So thymic cyst, bronchogenic cyst, esophageal duplication cyst, pericardial cyst, neuroenteric cyst. We've discussed the malarian cyst or cystophatory, thoracic duct cyst, mesothelial cyst. You can get cystic lesions sometimes in the pleural space and from infection, hydatid cyst. So those are, uh, this, this is a list of some types of mediastinal cystic lesions. So let's move on. Here we have a, an opacity here, and there it is in round opacity in the posterior costophrenic angle. So you actually don't want to mistake this for a mediastinal mass. This is the typical appearance here of a boctelec hernia. So there's fat here that herniating up into the paravertebral region. And on CT, we can also see the defect in the diaphragm and that's where we get the herniation of the intra-abdominal fat up into the thorax. So if I tell you that this patient has liver disease and we seem to have a retrocardiac mass here, how do we put that together? Well, here, of course, we need to think of varices. 
So with liver disease, these patients can have parasophageal varices, and that also can simulate a mediastinal mass. Notice the nodular liver contour, cirrhosis there in the upper abdomen. So these are varices, and that can also give you that can also simulate a mass either in the middle or posterior mediastinum there on your chest radiograph. And then, of course, here is a large mediastinal mass. Seems to be in the posterior mediastinum, but you really can't separate it from the aorta here, of course. I'm showing you this so that you remember aneurysm in your discussion of all mediastinal masses. Any mass you cannot separate from the great vessels, always consider aneurysm, especially if you are asked questions about biopsying the lesion. So that is our discussion of posterior mediastinal masses. So you should be familiar with all of the entities that are listed here. And remember aneurysm and lung cancer for all of the mediastinal compartments. So let's move on now to diffuse mediastinal abnormalities. So here we have winding of the mediastinum, but it is very smooth winding. Notice there's no lumpiness or bumpiness. There's no mass effect, very smooth winding of the mediastinum. So what does this represent? Well, this is all fatty tissue. This is mediastinal lipomatosis. So in mediastinal lipomatosis, we get very smooth winding of the mediastinum, no mass effect. So this can be associated with Cushing's obesity, obesity steroid use, very smooth widening, no mass effect on the trachea or esophagus. And you might also have extra pleural fat uh, and cardiophrenic angle fat pads that are enlarged in these patients. Easy diagnosis with CT, we have homogeneous mediastinal fat causing that smooth widening of the mediastinum. If I tell you this patient has had chest pain three weeks after cabbage, here we see the clips in the anterior mediastinum. We also notice these lucencies. These are air bubbles. You should not have air bubbles in the mediastinum more than two weeks after surgery. So we need to think of gas forming infection. This is mediastinitis. So fluid collection with air bubbles there in the mediastinum. That's an example of mediastinitis. Here's another example, loss of fat planes there in the mediastinum, some air bubbles in the mediastinum. Another example of mediastinitis, this can occur from esophageal perforation, but this can also occur from spread of infection down into the mediastinum from the head and neck. This was mediastinitis secondary to a retropharyngeal abscess in this patient, and that spread down into the mediastinum. So mediastinitis can occur as a complication of infections of the head and neck. So mediastinal abscesses can occur from surgery, esophageal perforation, iatrogenic or Borhobs, or spread of infection from adjacent regions. Of course, an abscess fluid collection with air bubbles in it, uh, we should not see anything like that more than 14 days after surgery. So gas bubbles in the mediastinum should make you concerned about pneumomediastinum, uh, of, uh, should make you concerned about uh, the mediastinal abscess or mediastinitis. So in our next case, we see here there's marked winding of the mediastinum, but six hours prior was not there. Mediastinum looked normal six hours prior. This patient is in the intensive care unit. Patient is intubated. So here we must ask, was there, were there any attempts, uh, were there any procedures, were there any attempts at central line placement? And indeed the answer is yes. So here this represents mediastinal hematoma. Six hours later, there's marked enlargement of the mass there as the bleeding continues. And here on CT, we can see the hematocrit effect here as the denser blood kind of falls down to the more dependent regions here of these collections. So this is a large mediastinal hematoma, which occurred as a complication of line placement. So there's a large pseudoaneurysm here in the brachiocephalic artery, which occurred as a complication of this line placement, which caused bleeding into the mediastinum. So mediastinal hemorrhage can give you acute widening of the mediastinum. Of course, we can see it with iatrogenic causes like central line placement. Of course, trauma can do that. Rupture of aortic aneurysms, spontaneous hemorrhage, of course, is rare. So acute widening of the mediastinum, especially in a patient who is in the hospital, think about mediastinal hemorrhage, especially from iatrogenic procedures, and these can get 
big very quickly or can enlarge very quickly and the typical appearance of hemorrhage on CT high attenuation collections especially with the somatocrit effect as the higher attenuation clotted blood tends to settle more dependently within the collection so that is our discussion of diffuse mediastinal abnormalities so these abnormalities usually involve more than one mediastinal compartment and all will show widening of the mediastinum on the chest radiograph all right so i thank you for your attention and we will see you next time